London, in short, is fascinating. Having lived here for 15 years, all of my life, I have been blinded to the incredible history that this vast metropolis holds within. London is wonderful, and it continues to evolve, making it now a world city. London boasts a population of 8.8 .8 million people, myself included, and is 1,572 kilometres squared in size. During this podcast, I want to uncover a period in London's history that is of great interest to me, 1850 to 1901. The opening description of London in Time Out. Immersed in history, London's rich seams of eye-opening antiquity are everywhere. The city's buildings are striking milestones in a unique and beguiling biography, and a great many of them the Tower of London, Westminster Abbey, Big Ben, are instantly recognisable landmarks. There's more than enough innovation, the Shard, the Tate Modern Extension, the Sky Garden, to put a crackle in the air. But it never drowns out London's seasoned, centuries-old narrative. Architectural grandeur rises up all around you in the West End, ancient remains dot the city, and charming pubs punctuate the historic quarters, leafy suburbs and river banks. Take your pick. Towards the latter end of Queen Victoria's reign, London had a firm grasp on the world. It was backed by a powerful empire with a large population that was ever growing. London was a force to be reckoned with. However, not as all as it seems, there was lavish wealth and a rich culture, but it had a darker side. Poverty, crime, squalid slums, so what was life like for those who lived in London? My aim is to discover as much as I can of the hidden London. Imagine walking around a tightly packed city with brown skies and putrid air. Imagine walking past horses traveling along a cobbled road. Imagine the coughing, the mutterings of common thieves eyeing you up, the odd scream in the distance. Don't believe this? That is London in the 1880s. Great Britain was the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution, which garnered the attention of many migrants. As London became more powerful, the population quickly escalated to about six and a half million people towards the end of the 19th century. With all these new people coming in helping the economy, you would expect the biggest city in Britain, London, to be luxurious, which it was. But there was a darker side to it. With such a large population, London was heavily overcrowded. Jobs became harder to acquire, causing a lot of the population to go into prostitution or a common criminal. Houses which today would support five people became DOS houses with 12 people in a single room. Even being in a room wasn't much better than on the streets, with uninsulated small rooms without a single essential, but a bed with a rotten, broken mattress upon a damaged frame. Life was miserable for most. This life they had was unimaginably upsetting and would turn any man or woman to a life of drinking. London was full of skinny, shoeless, dirty people who lived among squalid conditions that depressed them enough to the point of heavy drinking every night, throwing away pennies they may have earned to possibly feel some ounce of happiness. Although the poor massively outweighed the wealthy, the rich shone through in Victorian society, and life was decent. Or so it seemed. Life as an upper-class Victorian was particularly difficult, as any wrong move could tarnish these essential beloved reputation. For the wealthy, reputation and status was everything and often a talking point in high society. Marrying off children, being invited to parties, all relied on your reputation. Any incorrect move, like the unfortunate pregnancy of maids or house staff, could ruin a man's reputation and then his life. Business, family, friends would all move on as he would be seen as an unfit parent. If you thought life was hard for the rich, you are forgetting the poor, who would watch these heavily wealthy men and women prance around the dirty, tightly packed, squalid London streets. One amazing thing about society was the huge class divide between the haves and the have-nots, and how closely in proximity they lived to one another. Eighty years before, 
The painter Hogarth very ably demonstrated this in his famous series, The Rake's Progress. One final thing to note about the rich, they had an inordinate amount of power. If you had a title, you were invincible. They were constrained by the social morals and manners one false step and they would lose face and their status. The gentry would find their pleasures on the darker side of London town from Whitechapel to the bordellos of Soho. Let me tell you about the penny hang. What would happen is they would spend all of their money on beer in a pub instead of using it for obviously going to a doss house or somewhere to sleep. So they'd spend it all in the pub, they'd walk out absolutely wasted, they'd be completely gone. They'd walk out and there'd be this room and it would look like uh, it, it's where you put washing, oh, just a bunch of washing lines. In actual fact, that was where, if you pay a penny, you could hang on that line for the night. And you were so drunk, you know, it would feel like you were sleeping. Because you'd literally, you'd go on it like that, and you'd just fall asleep. To talk about Victorian London without mentioning its famous murders and murderers would be an oversight. Jack the Ripper may get all the attention today, but the 19th century had a real rogue gallery of eerie villains. Mary Manning, Amelia Dyer, Kate Webster, Richard Dadd. But going back to the Ripper, I'd like to read the statements of the policemen who found the bodies of Jack the Ripper's victims. Chapman's body was discovered at about 6am on Saturday 8th of September 1888, near a doorway in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields. As in the case of Marianne Nichols, the throat was severed by two cuts. The abdomen was slashed entirely open and it was later discovered that the uterus had been removed. At the inquest, one witness described seeing Chapman at about 5.30am with a dark-haired man of shabby genteel appearance. Stride and Eddowes were killed in the early morning of Sunday 30th September 1888. Stride's body was discovered at about 1am in Dutfield's yard off Burner Street, now Henrik Street in Whitechapel. The cause of death was one clear incision which severed the main artery on the left side of the neck. The absence of mutilations to the abdomen has led to an uncertainty about whether Stride's murder should be attributed to the Ripper or whether he was interrupted during the attack. Witnesses thought that they saw Stride with a man earlier that night, but gave differing descriptions. Some said that her companion was fair, others dark. Some said that he was shabbily dressed, others well dressed. Edo's body was found in Mitre Square in the city of London, three quarters of an hour after Stride's. The throat was severed and the abdomen was ripped open by a long, deep, jagged wound. The left kidney and major part of the uterus had been removed. Nichol's body was discovered at about 3.40 a.m. on Friday 31st of August 1888 in Bucks Row, now Durward Street, Whitechapel. The throat was severed by two cuts and the lower part of the abdomen was partly ripped open by a deep, jagged wound. Several other incisions on the abdomen were caused by the same knife. Kelly's mutilated and disemboweled body was discovered lying on the bed in the single room where she lived at 13 Millers Court, off Dorset Street, Spitalfield, at 10.45am on Friday 9th of November 1888. The throat had been severed down to the spine and the abdomen almost emptied of its organs. The heart was missing. The canonical five murders were perpetrated at night, on or close to a weekend, either at the end of a month or a week. The mutilations became increasingly severe as the series of murders proceeded, except for that of Stride, whose attacker may have been interrupted. Nichols was not missing any organs, Chapman's uterus was taken, Eddowes had her uterus and kidney removed and her face mutilated and Kelly's body was eviscerated and her face hacked away, though only her heart was missing from the crime scene. These are the victims of Jack the Ripper. A whole industry has been set up around the legend that is Jack the Ripper. There are tours, walks, exhibitions in Madame Tussauds, the London Dungeon and countless books on the subject. We may never know the true identity of him or her, but one thing is for sure, like London, we find it endlessly fascinating.
In conclusion, having walked through the streets of London, entered its galleries and museums, marvelled at its monuments and studied this time period, I feel I've only dipped my toe into the history of London. The more I discover, the less I know. As Samuel Johnson once said, when you're tired of London, you're tired of life. This London will evolve. It will continue to intrigue generation after generation. London, in short, is fascinating.